Hello, and welcome to our production of Uprooted, Rerouted, narratives of Bhutanese and Iraqi refugees losing and finding homes. Thank you all for coming, and we are extremely excited to share our work with you today. The 12 students performing tonight are part of the Duke Commerce Uprooted, Rerouted program. It's been an exciting semester for all of us, as we have been fortunate enough to participate in this program, co-sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics and the Office of Undergraduate Education. This sem semester has been an amazing opportunity for us to engage or immerse ourselves in the study of refugees and forced migration. The international refugee problem cannot be ignored. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees the UNHCR, is the leading agency in the protection and resolution of refugee problems. It acknowledges some 11 million persons worldwide as refugees. This number is only a fraction of the nearly 50 million displaced persons worldwide. While there are, all, while there are issues that all displaced persons have in common, Do Commerce focuses specifically on that subset of persons legally defined as refugees. Persons who have fled from, them, from their home country and cannot return because they have a well-founded fear of persecution based on religion, race, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. As straightforward as this definition seems, the real-life deline delineation is much more complex. Was the persecution actually personally targeted? Is there a strong enough fear of persecution? Is the person's account of his or her experiences believable? These are the questions that shape the defining of an individual as a refugee. And yet, once defined as a refugee, a person's future still remains uncertain. Most refugees will receive support in the country to which they fled until they, have, until they can voluntarily and safely return to their home country. A small number of refugees will be allowed to become citizens in the country to which they fled. An even smaller number, primarily those who are at highest risk, will be resettled in a third country. The refugee experience is often associated with refugee camps, but that is not the universe, universal experience. Around the world, refugees are living in broadly varying conditions, some in well-established camps, others in collective centers or makeshift shelters. More than half of the world's refugees are living in urban areas. Whether in camps, cities, or in between, all refugees lack the basic protections of citizenship and have no clear future. They have been uprooted and they do not know where or when they will be able to put down new roots again. Our program of study this semester has provided us with a broad understanding of the dynamics and drivers of global displacement, and has also given us particular insights into the experiences of Bhutanese and Iraqi refugees, which have local as well as global dimensions. Locally, while fewer than 1% of refugees worldwide will ever resettle, the US Department of State has made these two groups a priority for resettlement. Many Iraqis and Bhutanese have even become our neighbors here in North Carolina. Globally, the two groups represent distinct displacement trajectories. The exodus of refugees from Iraq has been dispersed throughout the Middle East, with large concentration in major cities like Cairo. While the Bhutanese refugees have been largely concentrated in camps in a single region on the plains of eastern Nepal. We were able to study these two very distinct refugee populations through a comparative lens in order to develop a deeper understanding of the complex phenomena of displacement. Key contrast between the two populations allowed for a unique perspective on international displacement. The Bhutanese came from agricultural backgrounds and have been living in camps in Nepal for two decades, supported by international aid organizations. To some Bhutanese refugees, life in the camps is all they have ever known. They feel a strong sense of community here, along with a mixture of fear and excitement about the changes resettlement is bringing to their lives. Compare them to the Iraqis, typically highly educated professionals whose flight from their home has been occurred recently and have been found in countries where they sought protection to be consumed by their own violent uprisings. Dispersed across the city of Cairo, the Iraqi refugees we have met have little sense of community and no secure basis of support. The future of resettlement also vary drastically between the two groups. Despite the fact that Iraqi refugees far outnumber Bhutanese refugees, vastly higher numbers of Bhutanese than Iraqi refugees are resettled each month. For example, 
One typical month last summer, nearly 2,000 Bhutanese refugees resettled to the U.S., compared with about half as many Iraqi refugees in the same month. These differences are largely a product of the distinct historical, political, and international security situations of the two populations. In our Immerse program, we begin our studies of refugees where, where many journeys had, at least temporarily, ended here in the Durham region, where prominent communities of Bhutanese and Iraqis are developing. We were able to connect with them over the course of the semester through both community engagement and research. Our interactions with the communities here revealed the struggles refugees face upon resettlement, thus illuminating that the challenges of displacement continue even after a refugee is given a path to citizenship in a new country. Working to address gaps in the resettlement process, we develop community engagement projects, specifically targeting the problems that individuals in the refugee community have identified. We focus particularly on the idleness and isolation that many refugees face upon resettlement to a strange land. We advance projects that would promote skills and occupations the refugees pursued prior to resettlement, while also hoping to engage the refugees in the Durham community. <laughs> Our goal is for these programs to continue to develop and grow after the semester of, of Immerse has ended. This semester also allowed us to dive into research. With training in the methods and ethics of field-based research under our belts, we went abroad to study the displacement experience of the Bhutanese and Iraqi refugee populations. For four weeks during the semester, we moved out of the classroom and into the field. Six of us in Cairo, Egypt, and six of us in Damak, Nepal. Throughout our time abroad, we were able to connect with the local refugee communities and conducted a series of life story interviews with the refugees. We each had an individual theme in mind as we explored the questions of how displacement affects the moral world of refugees. What possibilities exist for them to live a life of meaning? What were the goals? dreams, relationships they valued before they were forced to flee their homes, how their experiences fundamentally changed their beliefs about what is good and bad in this world. Through our life story interviews, we learned not only about the history of each person's displacement and how they managed to sustain their, how to sustain their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, but also how the experience of displacement shaped their sense of identity, memories of the past, and hopes for the future. While the field experience provided us each with rich content for our research projects, a significant benefit of the work was our ability to develop relationships with the individuals we interviewed. Sitting beside the refugees and listening as they told us their stories brought the global issues we had studied here at Duke closer to heart. As we saw the experiences of displacement through the words and expressions of the refugees themselves, we have developed the monologues we're presenting tonight as a way to share some of those words with you, to give you the opportunity, as we had, to see refugees as mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, friends, widows, as humans. Our interview selections each highlight a different element of the refugee experience that resonate, resonated throughout many of their stories. Before presenting the monologues, I would like to thank on behalf of all 12 students and our program as a whole, all of the refugees we interviewed throughout our field work. They shared their stories, their hearts, their hopes, and their homes with us, and we are so grateful. As we begin, mind that the program is divided into two portions, focusing first on the Bhutanese refugees and then second on the Iraqi, each preceded by an introduction of the population's background. We hope you enjoy it, and as a final note, we also kindly ask that you turn off all cell phones and hold all applause until the very end. And please, no flash photography. Thank you. In the early 1990s, members of an ethnic minority population in southern Bhutan began to flee violence and persecution from the Bhutanese government. Denied their citizenship rights due to religious and cultural differences, these Bhutanese refugees eventually sought protection in UNHCR-established camps in Nepal. 
The number of refugees eventually swelled to over 100,000, housed in seven camps in eastern Nepal. Initially, there was hope that the Nepali government would agree to give the refugees Nepali citizenship. However, Nepal has been consumed by its own political upheaval over the past 20 years, including a Maoist rebellion that began in 1995 and the resulting abolition of the monarchy. Nepal has since formed a republic that continues to struggle for stability. These events mean that the integration of the Bhutanese refugees into Nepal has not been a viable option. Meanwhile, the Nepali government has had repeated talks with the Bhutanese government in an attempt to allow the refugees safe return to Bhutan. All of these talks have failed. Therefore, in 2006, it became clear that the only option for the Bhutanese was resettlement into a country that would give them a path towards citizenship. Since resettlement began, over 75,000 refugees have resettled to eight different countries. As many as 400 refugees leave the camps each week, bound for a new life. Of these, the vast majority will resettle in the United States. Bhutanese refugees living in the US receive basic employment and educational support from federally funded programs. Hopes for the future, however, are tempered by the knowledge that the education and skills the refugees have received in the camps may not be sufficient to allow them to pursue their goals immediately. While resettlement brings excitement and hope for a secure future, it also brings daily changes for all Bhutanese refugees. Those who are departing must leave behind family, friends, and the predictability of a life they have known for over 20 years. Those who remain, either awaiting the opportunity to resettle or hoping to return to Bhutan, face the loss of neighbors and companions. Parents lose children, Brothers and sisters become separated by continents. Each change experienced on a personal level adds up to a large impact at the camp level. Schools lose teachers. Camp committees lose leaders. Entire camps close, dismantling communities. Of the original camps, only two remain, Beldongi and Sanishari. In Nepal, Several international aid organizations help to manage and organize the camps. The most prominent of these organizations are the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration, and the World Food Program. The World Food Program supplies strict food rations every two weeks to households. Remittances and work in Nepal's informal economy have become very important in sustaining camp life. These provide resources with which all families can purchase clothing, materials for their homes, and fresh fruits and vegetables, all things that are not supplied by the rations. Life in the, life in the camps can be very difficult, providing a mixture of hard work and extreme idleness. Refugees build and repair their own huts. They transport heavy loads on their backs, and if they have the skills, they spend hours sewing or practicing metalwork or carpentry. At the same time, the camps offer little by means of recreation and there are no opportunities for legal paid employment in Nepal. The community strongly values an active lifestyle and hard work, but it's given very little chance to put those values to productive use. Nepali citizens have a largely positive view of the Bhutanese refugees in their society. The refugees provide cheap labor that has stimulated the economy. But this has also increased competition for the extremely limited number of jobs in Nepal. Socially, many Nepali citizens in the towns closest to the camps have developed relationships with the refugees, with some even marrying Bhutanese refugees. Thus, many Nepalis fear the economic and social changes brought by the shrinking and eventual closing of the camps. Bhutanese refugees have suffered from their original expulsion from Bhutan and the injustices they faced there. More suffering continues to occur through the complications of resettlement and the difficulties of camp life. However, there is also tremendous hope within the camps and the stories of resettlement. The stories we will present tonight from the camps demonstrate some of the complex history and important themes of sadness, joy, hope, and friendship present in the lives of the Bhutanese refugees we were so lucky to meet in Nepal.
Aditi. Kamal. Umesh. Nero. Badri. Bhakti. Aditi. Female, age 19, Beldongi 1. No, I'm not married. I'm only 19. Girls in the camp get married as young as 16, but I don't want to get married anytime soon. When we resettle, I want to learn about American culture. I want to go to school and work. I want to be able to do the same kind of work I do here in the camp, helping my community. I volunteer at the youth center. At first, I didn't know what it was. Now, all my friends are from there. I like learning new things and then teaching it to my community. My parents always encourage me in my work. My relationship with my parents is very nice. Everyone has to take care of their parents, but my relationship with them is especially good. We say that parents are the first teachers and teachers are the second parents. My parents taught me my first words, but my teachers in school taught me how to be something in life. School is like a temple. We learn how to walk in life. In life, we decide what we want. If I lived in the host community, the village area, I would not go to government schools. I'd have to take care of the house and field. They have no time to study. But my parents encourage me to follow my education. My siblings and I coordinate time well, so we all have time to do our work. Even my older sis married sisters come and help. My younger brother, too. Most boys aren't expected to help in the house, but my brother does. We have good relations. Yes, we have good relations in my family. Some of my family has already resettled in the U.S. They call us sometimes. My uncle calls us. He told my parents that when we come, we don't need to change our religion. But a lot of people call back and have been telling us in the camp that it'll be better if we follow the Christian religion. They say it'll be easier for us in the U.S. We're followers of the man of Dharma. It incorporates the gods of all religions. My uncle says that he knows a priest in Colorado and that there's a temple in Pennsylvania where we can worship. We're reselling in Cleveland. That's close, right? Sometimes I feel tension when I think of resettling. I feel I will leave my friends. I won't be able to follow my culture. I've heard in the US that we can't follow Deshaun or Tihar, and that we can only practice the funeral procession for one day instead of 13. In cultural orientation class, we learn that we won't be able to do the same worship we do in home. If we sing holy songs with loud sounds, people will come and arrest us in the US. But I think that my new life in the U.S. will be dutiful. If my life were a book, the title would be My Words. Kamal, male, age 35, Sanashari. I am the guardian of my family. I have two sons, one four years and one seven months. My older son is very clever and brave. He's never afraid of anything. Although he is only a baby, my smaller son is also very clever and active. He loves to laugh and call out to us. I am married to a local lady. She is 30 years old, and she stays at home to take care of our children. We met six years ago when we were both teaching in one of the local schools. We married four months after we met. Friends? Actually, my closest friends are not here. Actually, most of my friends are in Baltimore, Kentucky, Texas, Pennsylvania. Sometimes they call me and tell me to come, and I tell them I am very willing to come, but what to do? The process is not in my hands. I applied for resettlement four years ago. I was called into the UNHCR office one time in August 2010, but since then, I have not been called back into the office. It gives us mental trauma. I used to inquire time and again, time and again, and they reply, you need to wait for a while. And after I have asked time and again, 
Now, I am really tired. Now, I don't like to see the UNHCR office. Nobody is here. No relatives, my brother, all my friends and family have already been resettled. Except my wife and my two babies, if I die here, I will be alone. It is very difficult to stay here with no relatives. We have no support. If we got sick, there would be no one to take us to the hospital, no one to take care of us. It is very painful. Every night, we dream of our siblings in the United States. And they call us and say, try more. And we say, we are trying. What to do? My wife is Nepali, which slows down the process. While we wait to be resettled, I work here as the director of the 4C. Children in the camp whose parents no longer provide care for them are brought here to live. We collect their rations, cook for them, read to them, play with them. I came here to help these vulnerable children because I was once like them, with no parents to take care of me. I think maybe I have helped these children to have happy lives here. I want to resettle for my children so that they can live a good life and get a better education. But while I remain here, I do think it is important to develop good qualities in this community. If my life were a book, the title would be Sincere. Umesh, male, age 28, Baldongi 2. Yeah, sure. Ask me some questions. Whatever you want to ask me is fine. I was born in Bhutan. But here, in Nepal, this is my home. We used to sell bananas, and people would come all the way from India to buy the nuts that grew on our trees. We had lots of land. And now? Now we're homeless and landless. But that doesn't matter to me. What matters is that my heart is here in Beldongi. Significant moments? Well, there are lots of significant parts of my life. I'll never forget the day I left Bhutan, the day I arrived in Nepal, and the day I graduated from school. But three years ago, my family left for their third nation. Saying goodbye to my brother, my sister, my sister-in-law, I will never forget that day. It was December 7th. I was working, so I didn't get to go with them. As a refugee, I can't work in Nepal, so I had no choice but to go to India and become a teacher. I told my family, go on with your process, and I'll join you in a few years. But in India, I was like a charging bull. My health gradually became poor. I didn't feel like eating, and I didn't feel like talking. I just slept. I was so thin, and I couldn't do anything. I had caught the disease. I was a drunkard. There was no one to stop my bad habits, and I never considered that one day they would harm me. But when I came back to Nepal, I left all those bad habits behind. The four packs of cigarettes a day, the constant drinking, the headaches, I left it all behind, because I just don't want to die in Nepal. It would be very bad if my friends knew these things about me. They would have treated me much differently, worse. It's been three years, and I don't ever feel like smoking or drinking anymore. No one helped me stop. I was all alone, and I did it all by myself. Well, not completely by myself. God was there. Now the rest of my life is up to God. There's really nothing left for me to say, except that I really feel like I'm getting late for resettlement. I need to go. I see my family being so busy in America, and I want that too. They are a part of society, and I should be a part of society. I can become an American too, an American like you all. If my life were a book, the title would be 
The dream is not important in life, but the struggle. Nero, female, age 41, Sanishari. Draw a map? I don't know how to write. I never went to school, but if you ask me to sing or dance, I'll get up right now. Writing, I can't do. My children, though, they go to school. That's my priority for them. My sisters and brother and I, we couldn't go to school because in Bhutan, we were always working, grazing, bringing cattle back to the field. Back in Bhutan, there were orange groves and goats. But then I turned five, and my dad died. He didn't leave any land or money, and it was really hard on my mom. I don't remember when, but at one point she got really sick, and my brothers and sisters and I had to go door to door to work and ask for food when she died. Eventually, we worked in my uncle's field, but we were never his children. We just ate and worked there. I was nine when he arranged my marriage. He knew a family and told them, my niece is poor and this is a good opportunity for her. At the wedding, my husband's family brought dalbat and this delicious feast. It was so delicious. And it went along with all the instruments that guests were playing all night. I love to dance. And it's how I spent the whole night, with my sisters. I didn't realize till the end that I'd have to say goodbye to them. My brother, he worked six months to save for the wedding and make sure that it was special. And I, I wasn't ready to say goodbye. My brother stopped me from crying, insisting that we'd see each other again. And then I went and lived with my husband's family. He worked in measured land, so he'd come and visit every two weeks. My mother-in-law, she treated me like her own daughter. I was so surprised. It was something I hadn't had since before my mom died. Sometimes she would sneak out extra food and hide it for me. My husband also brought food when he visited. It was his way. He treated me like his little sister, and I found a new family. I was living in town with my husband when we had to leave. My husband's family, they were still living in the village, so we had to leave without them. My sister, though, she wasn't married, so we took her with us in the van to Nepal. I was worried nobody would take her, and we only had blankets to bring with us. When we first got here, the sanitation it was horrible. There were no huts, and a lot of people got sick and died. But we started working and both raised our families here. Isn't it beautiful now? When my sister found love, she told her husband to come to me to ask permission. She told me they would elope if I didn't agree, but I did. We both found our place here and we're happy. Can we dance now? If my life were a book, the title would be Happy Dancer. Audrey, male, age 60, Baldongi Extension. Do you want to know where it all began? Why we are here? How we got here? Well, it all started with the revolution. Before 1992, I lived in Bhutan with my mother, five sisters, and one younger brother. None of us went to school. There wasn't even a school in my town until the government ordered one to be built when I was 13. I helped build this school for the government, but I never had the chance to go. I had to work on the family farm and simply had no time for school. But this didn't matter because we were happy and we had a home. Then, the revolution made everything worse. The government put fire to the school that we had built in our town and told us that Nepali people couldn't go to school. They banned Nepali books across the entire country and forced schools to stop teaching my language, the language of Nepali, to the children. Some students went to the Indian-Nepali border to protest against the government, but I did not go. This made the government mad. 
So they came to my town, looking for the protesters. They lined us up by household, calling each house, one by one. Plot number 15, they called. I walked up to the policeman, and he pointed his rifle directly at my chest. What should we do with those protesters? He asked me. I told him that those students were not part of my household. He didn't like my answer. Go away from our country or we will kill you. Those words remain clear in my memory. December 12, 1992. Five days later, we left. Now in the camps, life is fine. My overall health is good. Since I know how to sew, I do tailoring for the community to earn some extra cash. For the past 13 years, I served as subsector head in the camp. Most people only serve for two years, but I did good things for the population, so the people re-elected me as their community leader. But still, I don't understand why I was kicked out of my country. I was born in Bhutan. I love Bhutan. Why would they want me to leave? So, you ask me what I think about my future. Well, I don't want to go to America. I still want to go back to Bhutan. And I want to be with my family in Bhutan. I know things may not be easy. I know the government may still threaten me. I know people may not accept me. But these things, they wouldn't matter, because I'd be home. I just want to go home. If my life were a book, the title would be Sad Story of a Bhutanese Refugee. Bhakti, male, age 18, built on YouTube. I want to go to America. I'll have a better life there. I want to go to Texas, because I have family there. It's just my father right here, because my mother died when I was young. But I have uncles and cousins in America. My father wants to go, too, to be with his siblings and parents. I talk to them over the phone sometimes. They tell me that life is good there, and they invite my father and I to come. Their lives are very different from mine. Here, there's too much dust, but it's clean in the U.S. There are more health facilities and good living standards there. But here, there's not enough to eat. I've applied for resettlement, but I haven't heard back yet. I think I'll be able to resettle, though. After I resettle, I want to continue my studies. My goals are to study and to make my future bright. The more education you get, the better job you can get. I'll do whatever work I can do in America. I'll be American then. I live here in Nepal now, and I follow the cult tradition, cultural traditions here. After I resettle, though, I'll do things according to that environment. I want to do what others are doing there. Now I'm Bhutanese, but after I resettle, I'll be a citizen of that country, and I'll do those things. I'll study and get a good job. I'll be happy. You want to know about my religion? Well, I don't follow one. I want to be Christian after I resettle, though. All of my relatives in the U.S. are Christian. Some were Christian when they lived here in Nepal, and some became Christian after they went to America. Sometimes I talk to them about it. They tell me that I should convert. They tell me to become Christian, too. Nothing happens when you convert, but I think my future will be better if I'm Christian, too. My father's Hindu, but I think he'll also be Christian after we resettle. We talk about it sometimes. I don't talk about religion much with my friends, though. Some of them are Hindu, and some are Buddhist. I think that all religions get along here. Mostly, we just talk about our studies and about resettlement. We all go to school together. I spend most of my time with them. I think we'll still be friends after we resettle. They all want to go to America too, but I think to different states. If I could, 
I'd want to come back to Nepal and also to Bhutan after I reset. <coughs> I mean, I've never been to Bhutan and my father didn't tell me much about it, but I know people here think about it a lot. Right now though, I want to go to America. If my life were a book, the title would be The Story of My Life. The Iraqi refugee population of Cairo, Egypt, arrived after 2003 in an attempt to escape the chaos that followed the American invasion of Iraq. A country with a rich history and culture now torn by war, Iraq's last 30 years have been unstable to say the least. In 1980, Iraq and Iran engaged in an eight-year war that thrust the country's economy into recession and began a steady decline of security conditions in Iraq. Later, in August of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait an act to which the United States responded rapidly, further diminishing the country's economic and political security. After this, the United Nations placed an arms embargo and economic sanctions on the country, damaging Iraq's stability even more. During this period of instability, the Kurds and Shia rebelled against Saddam Hussein's oppressive regime. The government violently suppressed both groups, which propelled many of them to flee the country. The United States invaded Iraq in 2003 overthrew the Bayath regime, and ousted Saddam Hussein. The United States then set up a weak and ineffective transitional government that was supposed to ensure a smooth transition of power from the old government to one the people wanted. Instead, this makeshift government became a problem in its own right, unable to address the major problems within Iraq. A Shia-led government was hastily placed in power, and sectarian violence engulfed the nation as militant campaigns against the current regime, the previous regime, the United States, the supporters of Saddam, the Sunnis, and the Shia ran rampant across the country. This violence divided Iraq and its people. At the height of the displacement crisis, UNHCR, UNHCR estimates that some 4.7 million persons were displaced, 2.7 million of whom are internally displaced within Iraq's own borders, and 2 million of whom became refugees after having fled the country. Not since the creation of Israel in 1948 has there been a larger flow of refugees from any other country in the Middle East. The Iraqi refugees fled to a number of nearby countries in the region, arriving in large numbers to Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and Lebanon, while smaller numbers escaped to Iran and Turkey. The refugees we worked with are the Iraqi refugees of Cairo, Egypt. Egypt hosts one of the largest urban refugee populations in the world, and most of Egypt's population lives in or around its capital, Cairo. With nearly 20 million inhabitants, Cairo, Egypt is one of the largest and most densely packed cities in the world. Among those 20 million inhabitants, many refugee populations such as, such as Sudanese, Syrian, Eritrean, Ethiopian, Somali, and Iraqis are well represented. Because the Iraqi refugees live mainly in the city as opposed to living in camps like the Bhutanese, their position in the refugee world is vastly different. Instead of living in a camp in which food is, food is distributed, how, housing however meager is provided, and education again however inadequate is available, they survive largely cut off from the UNHCR and other refugee aid organizations sprout throughout a large and expansive city. Refugees in Egypt are not given permanent residency and are therefore not legally allowed to work or enroll their children in the Egyptian public education system. Iraqi refugees often rely on past savings, money from families still in Iraq, and other remittances to pay for private schooling. Stipends and aid services are available to refugees, however they expect us to seek out the organizations themselves. Financial assistance is limited, temporary, and only available to the most vulnerable refugees, which, according to the UNHCR, means a refugee who either has some type of debilitating medical need, is a single mother, has experienced violence or torture, 
or as a minor between the ages of 16 and 18. Even then, financial services are near 150 to 165 Egyptian pounds per month, which translates to less than $25. With the recent developments in Syria, thousands of Syrians have flooded into Cairo and crowded the already stressed system of the UNHCR, leading to the opening of a separate branch whose only purpose is to process Syrians. Adding this complication into the already overworked aid, aid agencies has made many Iraqis feel that they are being pushed to the back burner of these organizations. The Egyptian government does not support the refugee population and has a fairly ambivalent relationship with the aid agencies who do serve refugees. The situation of Iraqi refugees in Egypt is further complicated because they are not allowed to work legally. Many Iraqis we interviewed were educated with college degrees, working in professions like law, dentistry, and medicine. The forced transition from being in middle and upper class in Iraq to living on only basic necessities in Egypt has made it particularly difficult to handle for many of these refugees. Because they are relying on finite funds, and because assistance is meager, refugees are in an extremely precarious situation that has many emotionally distraught and worried about their livelihood. Living conditions in the city are generally more cramped and less stable than the lives of the Iraqis before their displacement. This, in addition to their financial and security situations, has resulted in a deterioration in the Iraqis refugees' living conditions and has profoundly affected their psychological well-being. The rise in the number of gangs, home invasions, and sexual assaults in Cairo after the Egyptian Revolution left many refugees worried for their safety and for their future. In, com in combination with the post-revolution crackdown on NGOs, which affected refugee aid organizations, refugee livelihoods became even more unstable. Despite the immense magnitude of their problems, a glimmer of hope lies in the eyes of the refu Iraqi refugees through the lens of resettlement. Resettlement is the process by which refugees are moved into another country because they cannot return home, and their current country of residence resists local integration. However, resettlement remains a far-off dream for the vast, vast majority of these refugees. America put specialized programs in place to expedite the resettlement of Iraqi refugees after the invasion. However, in 2004, a change in policy drastically diminished resettlement rates. Last year, UNHCR Cairo only resettled 1,600 refugees from any country, 400 less than their quota. Iraqis were then but a fraction of this 1,600. Today, you will hear story for, stories from a number of Iraqis, each with unique concerns and responsibilities, fears and reservations, blessings and misfortunes. However, within this diversity, there exists a striking uniformity of troubles and disparities caused by their displacement and their current existence in Egypt. We hope the stories today will give you a picture of just how immensely displacement has seeped into the lives of Iraqi refugees in Cairo. The length of their stay in Egypt is now surpassing seven years for many, and funds are running low. This population is experiencing an unacceptable degree of political silence, and the clock is ticking for Iraqis living in Egypt. If they do not receive resettlement soon, they may never will. To repeat a question asked by the refugees we interviewed, when will we find a place for peace and rest? Layla. Nora. Mohammed. Amira. Amr. Selma. Layla. Female. Age 24. Nasser City. My husband and I, we met at the UNHCR in Cairo. It was a complete coincidence that we both ended up at this particular place on the same day and at the same time, since we both lived in different parts of Egypt. Neither of us planned to go to the UNHCR that day. I went that day and placed my sister to help my mother. My husband went that day in place of his friend, who at the last minute decided not to go. We met at the photocopying machine. My mother was having trouble photocopying the application forms. Thankfully, Muhammad came over and helped. While he helped her out, we talked a little. I was immediately attracted to his warm and caring personality. After he helped my mother, we talked a little longer, and then we exchanged phone numbers. 
After this day, we began to talk frequently through text message and phone calls. Then, after a brief period of courting, Muhammad and his family proposed to my family. I was ecstatic. Right after the proposal, his family was granted resettlement. So we had to plan our wedding quickly so that his family could come. Everything happened so fast. I was not expecting to get married in Egypt, mainly because there are not that many Iraqi men in Egypt. And my parents would never approve of me marrying an Egyptian man. Well, they might have allowed me to marry an Egyptian man if I truly loved him. I've always dreamed of getting married and starting a family. I wanted to start a family right away, but my husband and I decided and went, decided to wait until we were resettled to start a family. Having a child now would be difficult because we are both unemployed. We are only able to scrap by each month off of the money that both of our families send us. Also, having a child now would prolong our resettlement process. We would have to reapply for resettlement in order to add our child to the process. So, we must wait until we resettle to have a child. We are not sure how long it would take for our resettlement process to be complete. It could be a year. It could be two years. It could be six years. At this point, we're just waiting and hoping for the best. My desire to have a child has caused me to cry myself to sleep many nights. It is very frustrating that I have to wait, since I'm a newly married woman and I've longed to have a child my entire life. My frustration has caused many arguments to arise between Muhammad and I. Although it is not his fault that we have to wait, I tend to take my anger out on him. I tend to yell at him and voice my frustrations to him. Thankfully, he just listens. He always calms me down and argues that he wants his child just as much as I do. I also worry about having my first child in America. Once I'm resettled, my family will no longer be nearby to help me raise this child. What will I do without my mother's guidance? Will my family ever be able to meet my child? If my life were a book, the title would be The Love of Coincidence. Nora, female, age 28, 6th of October, City. I have never been able to tell anyone the story I am telling you now. I cannot trust anybody. I never leave the house, but if I have to, I will do so during school hours. I don't want to be threatened when my kids are by my side. I was hurt by people once, and now, <coughs> now I cannot trust them. Being a woman makes me feel trapped. I can't work and can't do a lot of things I want to. The events that occurred in my homeland are now happening in Egypt all over again. I feel like it will be worse this time around, so I want to be resettled. I wish to go to the United States to continue my education, perhaps even get a master's degree. I have so much energy, but I don't know how to use it. I can't find myself in this community. I want to settle down. I'm not comfortable. I want to make a place like home to buy things I cannot. I want to decorate my apartment to feel like a home, but I can't because I may leave it at any time. I want to wake up in the morning and go to work and come back. I want normal days like everyone else. The most important thing is to live in a place where I feel secure so I can call it home. I wish to trust and love people once again. I cannot replace this feeling with anything else. I wish the U.S. Gov government would help the Iraqis, especially because they are responsible for us leaving our homes. I specialized in television because I want to help document Iraqi suffering. I feel, I feel sad when I see American movies presenting us as retarded people as if they need to come rescue us, but they came here to invade us. My big hope is somebody like you will give my story to somebody in charge. We are suffering in every meaning of the word. They're torturing us. I stood for a whole month outside the UNHCR during Ramadan, fasting. Nobody answers me. Not just me, 
but all are Rockies. They are presenting us as terrorists, but came and invaded. The purpose of me studying media is to go to the U.S. and get a chance to let everyone know that this, this is not the real Islam. We have no nuclear weapons. We never did. I feel like we are deceived by the politicians. I feel like Americans believe their politicians. You come to our country, we have to at least defend ourselves. You defend yourself, your home, your family. My kids have no future here. At least if the United States took away our future, let them give a future for our kids. I want them to live in a country with security, study whatever they want, and excel. If my life were a book, the title would be The Lost Future. Mohammed, male, age 31, 6 of October City. I am your biggest fan. Because I like you, I became a bodybuilder, and because you won many championships. This is what I will say to Arnold Schwarzenegger when I meet him. How will I do this, you ask? I practice English every day. Yes, my cousin is better, but I watch American movies with him and practice online. It makes me feel secure. Otherwise, I exercise. Each day, I exercise and I learn English. I have memorized 77 English words so that I will not need a translator for Arnold. I also watch television. I watch soccer and I really enjoy American football because of the fighting, the violence of it, and the players' huge bodies like bodybuilders. Before I was kidnapped, I placed fourth place for the National Rocky Bodybuilding Competition. I escaped captivity and left Iraq before my captives could find me again. When I returned, I wasn't myself. I had so many problems. They hit me repeatedly with the butt of a rifle. Here is the scar. Even when I touch it now, it feels as if the ceiling is crashing down on my head. Every time I sleep, I have the same nightmare, being woken up by my kidnappers. So when I sleep, I don't open my eyes. Until I'm sure that the nightmare is not real, I do not open. Until I hear someone making a sound, I do not open. Because of my condition, my family wasn't able to deal with me anymore. So my father left me with my cousin in Egypt. They are still here, but pretend to not know me. I know this because when I tried to go home, they gave me looks as if I did not belong. I tried to go home twice. After that, they moved. My cousin and I live with other students in an apartment. We sleep on the floor in the living room. We pay the rent by cleaning and trying to cook food. When they're gone, we try to get jobs or promise the stores we'll pay back. My beliefs? I'm very interested in the Holy Bible, your book. Of course I'm Muslim, but I memorize the whole Bible. My beliefs belong to the merciful part of the Christian religion. I feel that the U.S. community is more merciful than ours. I feel like I belong to such community because I'm not with the Iraqi, Arab, or Muslim. I belong to none. I'm a zombie. Still, I exercise to meet Arnold. I love the sport and want to be as successful as him. It is my goal. If my life were a book, the title would be People Who Are Suffering. Amira, female, age 52, 6th of October City. My life in Iraq was good. 
It was my first home, and it had the most important things. Peace, stability, and security. There were laws, and things were organized. Of course, things weren't perfect under Saddam, but I was able to live, able to see a future for my children. Now, the militias are taking revenge and destroying Iraq. I can never go back. At first, I thought the war would end quickly. It was calm initially. I, I continued to work. But in 2006, everything changed. The Shiite mosque in Samarra was bombed. And then the war broke out between the Sunnis and the Shiite. Before this, all that was important was that you were Iraqi. There was no divide between Sunni or Shiite. In Baghdad, I lived in El Jadria. It was close to the American military base, and there were troops everywhere. You know, we felt protected because of all the military. Me? I never imagined something bad could happen. But after 2006, I learned I was living in a Shiite region, which is dangerous because my family is Sunni. Do you know Mehdi Army? No? Well, they are Shiite militia from Iran, and they wanted all the Sunnis out of Iraq. Sometimes, I would go into my garden and find bullet casings. But I didn't believe these threats until the Mehdi Army kidnapped my son, Mustafa. Mustafa went to a teacher's house for tutoring one afternoon. I was afraid something happened because he was very late. I called the teacher and he told me that as Mustafa left, men pulled up in a black van and took him. He was gone for 10 days. He was tortured. I paid to get Mustafa back, but I know they were not after money. They were taking revenge because my family is Sunni, because my husband was a translator and because I was a woman and had a job. This destroyed Mustafa. After this, we couldn't live in Iraq. I don't hate Americans because of the war. I just wish that they would have given us a good government that works for Iraqis, that they had set some rules before they left. Current regime, it's loyal to Iran, 100%. The Americans shouldn't have remained in control. They took everything from us. We have no job, no work, no retirement salary. They destroyed the Iraqi army. I worked for 25 years, and now my only source of income is the rent from my house in Iraq. My life now is <coughs> miserable. I don't feel safe here. Morsi will destroy Egypt, just as Hussein destroyed Iraq if left in power. I am living with no goals. I have no job. My son has no job. What do I have to live for? Everyone is half living and half dead. I am dying slowly. If my life were a book, that's a difficult question. My life, that's it. Amr, male, age 52, 6th of October city. What do you think of when I say the word Islam? Terrorists? Don't be fooled by these people who use my religion to justify the horrible things they do. I know their ways because I have lived through them. I used to be a fighter pilot for the Iraqi Air Force, but those days are gone now. My job was demanding and dangerous both while soaring through the air and working on the ground. I often had to work with the Americans, which ended up costing me everything. It was March of 2005. The threats began with Al-Qaeda. I found little envelopes with giant bullets in the mail almost every day, telling me and my family to get out. Before long, two other groups joined in, angered at me for what you Americans did to them. 
with three terrorist groups targeting me and my family, my commanding officers finally gave me orders to leave the country. I was bitter and angry when leaving because they thought they had won, but I had no choice. My friends began to disappear, and stories started going around of unspeakable, gruesome acts done under the cover of Islam. Some tell me I've abandoned my religion, but I know that the people who take my religion to this extreme are not Muslim. They are something entirely different, but they are not Muslim. They push me out of my home and force me into Egypt, but they can't stop me. They are constantly trying to end my life, and when their little plan failed, when I walked away from everything, they expected me to stop, but they don't know me. That's the thing about me, I never give up. So what if the Egyptians don't let us Iraqis work? I pay off the inspector. No one thought I could open an Iraqi restaurant in Egypt, but so what? I did it anyways. So even if you take away every option from me, I'm still gonna find a way. I have a family to look after. My son already can't attend university. He's smarter than most Egyptians, but we just don't have the money. That's the last thing that's going to hold me or my family back. I'm sick and tired of people telling me I'm not religious. They ask Amr, why do you shave your head? Why do you not grow out your beard? Well, I turn the questions around on them and ask, are all the people who pray happy? Are they all healthy? Are they all rich? It depends on us. Allah gives us, a, gives us a brain and a mind to think. He will judge me and ask me, how did I use it? Islam is a religion of peace and nothing more than that. We Muslims do not stand for violence and we do not stand for terrorism. I remember this one time, an extremist came up to me and told me I was becoming one of them, one of the Westerners. So I stood there and I said, look, you are driving a car made by Christians. You are sitting in air conditioning made by Christians. And the medications you use came from the Westerners. If you want to be against them, go and live in a tent in the desert. So I ask you again, what do you think of when I say the word Islam? If my life were a book, the title would be Heat. Selma, female, age 58, 6th of October City. How was my life in Iraq? Oh, I had the perfect life. Traveled to over 20 European countries, had a 600 meter house, two maids, two cars, three plots of lands. I even got married and had three lovely children. We had the money, so life was, well, easy. And then, well, you know the story. Life, life became not so perfect. The war started, political issues began to change, father died, husband married a second wife, travel was restricted, the dinar value dropped, sons were, were targeted because of their names, and, and, oh, you wanna know more about my husband's second wife? It's pretty simple. It's pretty ordinary in my life now. He had a respectable job with the government, but in order to keep it, he had to marry his boss. Oh, that gasusa, that spy, she took everything from me. I lost all of my wealth and property. My husband even said he was going to return to us after rebuilding himself, but he went to go work in Qatar with her. But of course, I could not show any of these feelings. I had to push through for my children. I had to push through for myself. I had to embody motherhood and replace fatherhood, which I did. When we woke up to 12 decapitated male heads in front of our house, I moved us to Jordan. I protected my family. When we drove over six dead bodies on the bridge near Saddam Hussein's house, I took my children and ran to the nearest open fields. I protected my family. When we finally escaped Iraq, I dressed my son up in an abeya a long black dress, and dodged all of the Mehdi army's checkpoints. I protected the family. I protected the family. Yes, I did. I think I did. I thought I did. If I am protecting my family, why has my son gained 150 pounds and failed four years of college? If I am protecting my family, why have I not been able to get a job to support my children? 
If I am protecting my family, then why do I have to ask my 22-year-old daughter to take me to the supermarket or my friend's house? If I am protecting my family, then why do I have to ask my children to help me with my diabetes medication or treatments? No, I am not protecting my family, not yet, not yet at least. I am only 58 years old. This is not old in your country. I will make it, and I will give my children the life that they deserve. I love this country, you know. I will always be Arab before I am ever Iraqi. These Egyptians are my brothers and sisters, but they're struggling too, so I refuse to settle down here. No, I will not buy a car. I will not live in 6th of October. I will not find a job. This is just one chapter of a book. What is the title of this book called? Why don't we call it Living with Faith for Now? Through these stories, we have tried to give voice to the realities of refugee lives. We hope to have illuminated how the seemingly impersonal events of history and current events have created deeply personal dilemmas that must be addressed every single day of a refugee's life. While we have studied the law, politics, and ethics surrounding refugee policy, our research has also focused on how refugees experience these policies in practice. The purpose of the life story interview, our research process, is to give a glimpse into individual experiences while also shedding light on how the larger political and historical processes are apart. In our research, we sought to discover what brings meaning to the lives of refugees through their individual stories. We then chose to highlight stories based on the themes that emerged in our interviews. The stories from Nepal emphasized shifting community, the strain of resettlement, and a desire to do meaningful work now, despite uncertainty about the future. The Bhutanese refugee camps function as models for the rest of the world, as aid organizations are commended for the stability and structure they have developed over the past 20 years. The stories highlight the presence of the aid organizations, but they also show the organization and duration of the Bhutanese refugee camps can be a source of hardship, as refugees struggle with the changing atmosphere of their close camp community through the process of resettlement. In addition, these stories emphasize the themes of uncertainty and concern over resettlement. Talking to resettled family only through the internet and seeing emptiness where friends once lived, this is resettlement for those still in the camps. To be able to care for one's family and produce something of value on one's own is a widely shared desire across this group although they differ in the ways that they imagine fulfilling these desires. One young woman earnestly waits to be resettled so that she may continue her education, while one elderly man believes his dreams can only be reached if he gets back to Bhutan. Despite all of their struggles, the Bhutanese express some hope for their futures through religious practice, prospects of future opportunity, and a strong commitment to family. The Iraqi stories highlight shifting livelihoods, hopelessness, and the lack of educational opportunities in Cairo. People commonly express a desire to continue their education and support themselves, but emphasize frustration and sadness that they have no means to do so. These monologues reveal the importance of having a means to use their education and skills, even as some refugees struggle to find any job opportunities at all. We hear the sounds of their hopelessness, fueled by an Egyptian government that expects Iraqi refugees to be self-sufficient, but so restricts their rights as to make this an unattainable goal. Responsibility for family, a potential source of pride, turns into a source of shame. A woman's desire to have children is hindered by her inability to afford to take care of them. Mothers and fathers fret about their inability to pay for schooling, to provide anything for their children. Each day's worries build upon those of the day before, and, once, and what they expected to be a temporary hardship, a brief interval, has become the story of their lives. Despite the distinct differences between Iraqi and Bhutanese refugees, 
Both groups of monologues emphasize both populations' nostalgia and a desire to return to a past where they could shape the direction of their lives. Both sets of stories also demonstrate anxiety for the future. We keep in the forefront of our minds that these stories are still ongoing today. The Iraqi and Bhutanese populations rep represent less than 3% of the total refugee population worldwide. Globally, forced migration is continually occurring as old crises persist and new crises evolve. Every minute, eight people are forced to leave their homes out of for fear of violence or persecution. The persistence of displacement creates a population of millions in need of solutions on the international, national, and local levels. While the magnitude of the situation is intimidating, there are also real, realistic opportunities for involvement and influence. We see these opportunities firsthand in North Carolina, which is resettling thousands of refugees per year. We emerge from the semester of study and engagement prepared to act and to educate, holding in our minds and hearts not just an understanding of refugee issues, but also all of the individual refugees' stories. The struggles and the tears, the friends and the children, the violence and the disorder, the rituals and the work, all the things that constitute their lives. We are so appreciative for your attendance tonight and are glad that we were able to share these stories and experiences with you. We would now like to invite you to a reception outside where we can meet and talk. Thank you so much for coming tonight.